dos 50 anos da FINEP e a segunda parte que foi hoje era para terminar uma, uma hora mas atrasou esse é o primeiro problema então eu pedi desculpas segundo ponto um dos palestrantes deveria ter chegado ontem mas por causa da tempestade lá em Houston ele, o voo foi cancelado não conseguiu chegar esse seminário aqui essa, não é seminário é um bate-papo nós organizamos, nós vamos ter aqui o professor James Corosse, é, Director of National Science Foundation for the Computer and Information Science and Engineering. É, pelo, pelo Skype nós vamos ter o professor Guru Parukar, ele é Executive Director Open Networking Foundation and On Lab, Stanford Platform Lab. E para comandar essa reunião, vou passar agora para o professor Edmundo. Mas queria lembrar o seguinte: para as perguntas, nós estamos com a Dayana, a Fátima, que vai recolher um papelzinho pequeno para vocês não escreverem muito. E tem mais alguém aí que vai. Edmundo, quem mais vai pegar o papelzinho aí? Ah, microfone. Ah, então, então, então tá bom, melhor. Vai ser microfone mesmo. Tá. Elas vão, levanta a mão, elas levam o microfone para vocês. Passar, convidar vocês para a mesa, e de professor Edmundo, professor James Corossa, vai ser bem informal tá? e que façam bastante perguntas. So, we're going to have a very informal session to help, hope, Those people, I think you can see that most of the people here are younger. There are some, That's great. Yeah, some of them <laughs> are a little bit older, but uh, in general, we have a student here. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to speak in Portuguese uh, first to uh, be easy to make it very uh, things very informal. He called me for the plays, but uh, okay, let. A primeira coisa que eu gostaria de traduzir para o professor uh, James Coroz, ou Jim. O professor Coroz é um velho amigo, he's an old friend. Uh, since the early days, I don't know how long ago, but he came here to copy several times. He even taught classes uh, here, and he's now a, a assistant director of National Science Foundation. And uh, he was invited by the Academy of Science to uh, lecture. So we had a two-day seminar in the Academy of Science. And I uh, asked him and Professor Paruka from Stanford. He was supposed to be in the seminar, but because of the hurricane, uh, he couldn't come. And uh, so it's a... Nós vamos fazer seminário muito informal. Então, é para os alunos fazerem perguntas. É, a gente enfatizou bastante na, na, na introdução. It will be a very informal uh, seminar. So, don't be shy. Uh, ask as many questions as you want. So, uh, façam a maioria das perguntas. Pode fazer em português. A gente traduz como vocês quiserem. Ok? Então, não vai ter apresentação formal. Vai ser um bate-papo. Essa que é a ideia. O Jim vai começar introduzindo o professor Parouca e passando um filmezinho que ele passou na academia, que é muito interessante. É de três minutos, é rápido para uh, introduzir o, o papo. Depois nós vamos é, colocar no Skype o professor uh, Parouca, que é, é, depois da introdução do que o, o Jim vai fazer. Ok. Ok. Isso é bom. Thank you. I'm very sorry. I don't speak Portuguese. I speak a little bit of French and Spanish, but no Portuguese at all. So I'm very sorry. Uh, but I'm very happy to be here. As Edmundo said, I can understand a little bit of Portuguese. I think this is maybe my fifth or sixth visit here to UFRJ. I've given seminars. I taught a class once while I was here. Um, and I see friends in the audience that I know from around the world and former students. So it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm here. A little, for a different reason than usual, usually you give a technical seminar, um, and we're here today to talk about innovation. As Ed uh, mentioned, uh, 
we were just at a meeting in, in uh, downtown Rio about innovation that was sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences and FINEPE. And so I want to talk about innovation. And so I will be here, a colleague and a friend of ours, Guru Parulkar, uh, will be attending, by, be attending by Skype. We had a big hurricane in the United States, and so the airports were closed, and I made it, and he didn't make it. But he'll be here by Skype. Um, I thought I'd begin just by telling you a little bit, because uh, you're all students, most of you are students, which is great. Uh, I'm sitting here, uh, I lead the directorate of Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the National Science Foundation. So we, as it says there, we fund basic science. This is part of our, when the NSF was founded in 1950, this is what we do. We promote the progress of science. Um, and so I'm here as an NSF official right now talking to you about some of the ideas and some of the programs that NSF is doing in innovation. So I want to take a little more of a institutional view. Uh, uh, my friend Guru, who's started multiple companies, has been a professor and a student and done a lot of amazing things. Uh, you may relate to him a little bit more because he's done this entrepreneurship him, himself. Uh, but I wanted to say just a couple words about the National Science Foundation and what we do. Let me see if I can move over here. This is great. Everything works. Uh, I wanted to say just a couple words about the National Science Foundation. If you were in the United States uh, and were to say to any faculty member, what does the National Science Foundation do, they would say, oh, the NSF funds basic research and hopefully my research. Right? Uh, so yes, that's what we do. We fund all areas of basic research. What I'm going to talk to you about here today, though, and, and the conversation will be more about innovation, and I want to tell you, as a, maybe as a bureaucrat or as an administrator or a government official, why that's important. Right? Uh, if you look at the NSF, what we do, yes, we promote uh, the progress of science, but we also advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and we secure the national defense. So your, uh, your National Academy of Sciences and FINEPE, the meeting that we had, it was really all about what the government can do, what programs the government can do to enable innovation, to be able to take those great ideas that you have with students. We all know everything starts with students, right? Everybody here who is a professor knows that you don't do anything without students, right? So it starts with students and their professors. How to take those good ideas and how to, how to create social good out of them and how to create new companies, how to create jobs. And um, I'm, I'm usually used to talking with PowerPoint slides and I don't want to use any PowerPoint slides, but I want to show you a video that we produced at NSF. It, it was produced just last week and it's about um, it's about innovation, and it's about jobs, and it's about the impact of research on the economy and on science. So what I'm going to show you is not anything, anything that would surprise you, but what I want you to just think about is the fact that NSF cares enough about going from knowledge to innovation to economic growth that we have specific programs that will fund researchers to learn how to become entrepreneurs. We provide competitive research grants to small companies, the Small Business Innovation in Research uh, Fund, that will allow new companies to take their research that extra step further and begin prototyping. So even though you probably know us at NSF as funders of basic research, innovation is really, really, really important to us. So let me, let's see if everything works, and let me see if I can play a video for you. It's pretty good. It began in the late 60s as a military-led communication network. Until NSF opened it up by creating a backbone and laying the foundation for unprecedented connectivity that changed the world. Real return on NSF investment. A 
America's is an innovation-driven economy. But new products and processes don't just burst on the scene fully grown. They're built on a foundation of years, even decades, of basic research. So why not just rely on the private sector for that research? It's not Corporations today are very heavy on the D side of R&D. If the research takes more than three years to become a product, the research side is seldom funded. That's where government organizations like the NSF play a crucial role in filling that research. NSF-funded research underpins vast segments of the American economy, enabling growth across the spectrum of American industry. Our investments help launch the mobile revolution, the 3D printing revolution, tissue engineering, and the rapidly booming field of nanotechnology. They're boosting our resilience to natural hazards and man-made threats. And helping transform American industry through advanced manufacturing. The net result? Jobs. And hundreds of billions of dollars added to the economy. Not long ago, two NSF-funded graduate students created a page rank method based on web links. Today, we know their work as Google. NSF-funded research built on game theory would soon become the foundation for Google's ad sales system, key to their profits. And we're helping develop more profitable agricultural practices and technologies. Higher yield drowned in disease-resistant crops that need less water and fertilizer. NSF funds startups and small businesses with radically innovative ideas to help get their discoveries out of the lab and into the market. We're a small company, and our original technology was based out of the university. We needed funds to see how well this could really work. Major market leaders like Qualcomm and Symantec were once tiny startups too, helped along by NSF funding. Qualcomm was very small when it received its first SBIR grants. Well, it meant the difference between starting and not starting. It, it meant everything in those early days. NSF investments in people helped develop the workforce of scientists, engineers, and technicians, critical to maintaining the technological edge that drives American economic growth. NSF, investments in basic research, innovative ideas, discovery, and discoverers, all in the national interest. The result is almost unimaginable returns for the economy and the American people. Okay, so that, that's just a short video, and, and again, I just, I showed that mostly to indicate to you how important innovation and what we're talking about here today is to the National Science Foundation, to the US government, and I heard again multiple times over the last day and a half how important it is to folks here in Brazil. So I think the things that you all want to do as students and what's driving you, my sense is there will be a very strong support system and a group of people here and, and programs that you can actually take advantage of. So I think this is going to be a very, very informal question and answer and just a free-flowing discussion. Are you going to sit here and moderate this? I'm going to be, I'm going to be front of the other. And in fact, you should, you should come here. Uh, <laughs> so it, I think Edmundo will, will moderate this, but yes. um, if we could bring up uh, Guru Parulkar. Uh, Guru is, is coming to us from Stanford University in Palo Alto. Yeah, uh, they said that it'll take a couple of one or two minutes to uh, bring him up. <laughs> oh, okay. And, well, and, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about Guru then. Uh, I'll, I'll give an introduction about him while we're, while we're setting him up, him up. So Guru Guru and I, I've known Guru as long as I've known Edmundo. He started out as a professor at Washington University in St. Louis. And right after getting tenure, he decided he really wanted to start a company. And he started a company. Hey, Guru. Hi. Hi, Jim. <laughs> We're yeah. going to work on getting your audio. I'm just introducing you. So I'm just introducing you and saying you started out as a child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you started as a professor at Washington University uh, in, in St. Louis and was doing uh, research on uh, network interface cards and putting processors on network interface cards long before active networking, long before software-defined networking, way back in the 1980s. Uh, as part of that work, Guru founded a company um, uh, with a colleague of his, John Turner. Guru then left academia. I, 
Yeah, and he's been spectacularly successful. He's one of these people who's jumped off the diving board and, and into the water. <laughs> uh, so he, his startup company was sold to Cisco. He has done other things since then, including um, uh, working at the National Science Foundation, working with venture capitalists, and then he was involved in the very early days of software-defined uh, networking and working with a number of people in the Stanford Berkeley axis, so Guru and Nick McEwen, um, uh, Scott Schenker and others uh, formed and one of, worked with one of the early companies in software-defined networking, which was later acquired very successfully. Um, and now he's on to other things, working on the um, ON, ON Lab. Uh, I guess he'll tell us more about the Open Networking Foundation and activities that he has. So, I mean, he's got tremendous experience in innovation, sort of firsthand experience. Um, and it's wonderful to have you here, Guru. Hi. Oh, Jim, uh, thank you so much. That's very, very generous of you. Uh, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to participate. And again, sorry, I cannot be there in person, but uh, really happy to participate remotely. And uh, Guru, uh, to break the ice, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the slide, you, one of the summary slides uh, that you had at the National Science Foundation uh, early in the morning uh, uh, that summarized what it takes to uh, do a startup and uh, what are the, the place. Do you remember the slides? You, Jim made sure. Here, yeah? Could you share that summary slide? Yeah, okay. So, uh, right, so I think that slide was trying to answer the question that get asked very often, uh, and that is uh, maybe twofold. One is, what does it take for an early innovation to have a real impact, uh, real impact in terms of creating either a billion dollar product or uh, changing the entire industry, and as a result, have a societal impact? Or another way to ask that question is, how does Silicon Valley has been doing it uh, successfully for so many years. And what I mentioned in that summary slide is uh, at the front end of the innovation, uh, you of course need graduate students, uh, professors, a university environment, a funding agency such as National Science Foundation, and you need industry participation. So you need all of that to be able to take an idea to uh, research prototypes, to publications, to something that can be considered an innovation that is ready to have some impact. When you go to the second half, that is how do you take that innovation to a real impact, then you need entrepreneurs, you need a venture capitalists, you need a talent pool beyond the grad students and faculty members, and you also need industry again in order to make your uh, product or your company successful. So that is a very generic description and what makes something like Silicon Valley work well is because Silicon Valley has these two premier universities, uh, that is University of California, Berkeley, as well as Stanford University. Uh, they benefit from National Science Foundation and other funding agency to take their ideas to research prototypes and all of that. Uh, then. Uh, fortunately, because of the long history, uh, Silicon Valley has a long list of venture capitalists uh, that believe in funding all the way from at the seed level, very early stage investment to the Series A investment to later stage investment as well. Uh, and then there is a, because there have been so many startups in this area, there is a very good talent pool and the talent pool is all the way from entrepreneurs to uh, people who do product management, to people who can become uh, CEOs, to people who can help with financial, to lawyers and all of that. So having that broad talent pool makes a huge difference because then as your idea is maturing, you can get a lot of help uh, from people that have done in the past or who still have an ambition to do it more of it and you can benefit from that. And then obviously the local industry makes a huge difference because uh, we, are benef we benefit from the fact that we can get an early preview of what 
some of the leading companies are struggling with or what their next set of challenges are going to be. So, for example, working with Google, working with Facebook, and some of these companies uh, prompted us to say, yeah, software-defined networking has long legs and it will be worthwhile to focus on that. And that is what helped us and it helps other people to focus on important problems. They also become source of funding. They also become source of early adopters. As you build your company, as you build your products, some of these companies become early adopters. And that is extremely important when you are bootstrapping a company and a product. So I think, uh, fortunately, in Silicon Valley, because of 40, 50 years of history, a lot of these things come together. And as a result, uh, it has been somewhat more successful than other places in taking innovations to products and companies and having a real impact. I hope that was the summary slide and I hope uh, Jim and Edmundo, uh, this is what you wanted me to summarize. Yes, thank you very much and I'd say that's very informal, so now uh, open for questions. What would like, uh, okay. Uh, no? Oh, I jumped there, it's easier. <laughs> Okay, so I actually listed eight questions. I'm gonna make two, and if no one else has, I can go on. Um, so I'm, I will try to bring our discussion here a little bit more to Brazil, since we're in here, and specifically in Rio. So two questions regarding our context. Um, I don't know how deep uh, your knowledge is regarding Brazil, but so two questions. One is, how do we re react with innovation in a crisis context? And the second one is, which strengths do you see in Brazil to become a strong and resistant country? To start with. Okay, so I, I'd be happy to make a first pass on that. So you asked two questions and then I'll turn it over to Guru. Your first question was reacting in a crisis and then secondly, what, what I see as strengths. Um, so, so this might seem a little, the English word is vacuous, sort of empty to you, but it really is the case that times of crises are when things really change a lot, right? And so my sense is that uh, jobs and economic development and opportunities are probably first and foremost in anybody's mind. So I think that that creates opportunities to, to be able to uh, move companies forward. And we, we can come and talk about steps for doing that in a second, but I think that you know, times of crises, a lot of times people will tell you that's an opportunity to do something. And think about you know, if you've got an idea, you want to start a company, you want to employ people, you want to do something, that's exactly the kinds of things that are needed right now in a time of crisis. So I think in a sense that's an, that's an opportunity. Of course, there's, uh, I understand there's a lot of suffering. Now, what I think of as the strength, um, you know, when I think of Brazil, I think of two things. I think of fabulous students. I mean, the students who have come from uh, UFRJ and around here in, in particular to the University of Massachusetts have just been totally awesome. I mean, they are, they have been the, you know, the, some of the very best students that I've seen coming from anywhere around the globe. And so I think the talent pool that I've seen coming from Brazil in terms of students is just, uh, I mean, it's really off the charts. I mean, you know, I, I know others of you, you know, people here, students who've gone to France. So I will tell you around the world, you talk to professors and they, if you get an opportunity to have a Brazilian student come and work in your lab, you always say yes. I mean, without fault, ever. Anybody always says yes. So I think the students here are incredibly strong. Now. Guru, the slide he actually used when he, we, he said, well, where does this all start, right? It all starts with ideas, and ideas all start with faculty and students. And like I said before, any faculty who's being honest with you knows that nothing happens without students. So I think that <laughs> the students that you have here, the high quality of the students and the high quality of the faculty also uh, that you have here are, are real, real strengths. So, you want to add anything, Guru? 
Yes, I guess, uh, yes, I want to echo the a couple of thoughts that uh, Jim mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, crisis. That is a, a great time to do disruptive innovations and take them to market. And the second thing about student, uh, the only thing I want to uh, add to that is, uh, again, I'm not an expert on Brazil by any stretch of imagination, but whatever I read, Brazil is also one of the uh, four or five of uh, growing economies. Uh, I mean, people put India, Brazil, China uh, into one particular basket. And uh, from that point of view, when you, you have a growing economy, uh, that is uh, when there are opportunities for you to build local products and uh, local companies that could serve the country and as a result have an advantage over anyone that is coming from outside. So without knowing a, a whole lot, I would think that uh, hopefully there are entrepreneurs in Brazil who are looking at uh, the local needs and the local growth and uh, wanting to create companies in that context. Uh, China is obviously a very good uh, example how they have created companies that serve their market really well and they have become giants. Uh, even at the globally, I mean, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, these are all Baidu. Uh, of course, there are major differences between China and Brazil, but something that uh, we could uh, learn from. Uh, because I'm originally from India, I have seen even in India, there are, as India is growing through this growth, uh, uh, there are companies that are being created in India that serve the local market and are uh, doing really well. Um, and so I'm assuming the same opportunities exist in Brazil as well. And love to hear your feedback because I'm just uh, speculating here and love to uh, hear from you as well. Hello, thank you both for being here with us. My name is Frederico, I'm from the Biomedical Engineering Program. And um, I'd like to say that um, I sense, um, at least it's, it's my feeling that uh, there is a, a, a large uh, death valley between the ideas here, a deep and wide death valley, between, between uh, ideas and uh, innovation in Brazil, especially in high tech. Uh, for one, we, we don't have uh, as much access to infrastructure, to hardware, to satellites. India has launched, uh, I think, 104 satellites at once uh, last month or the, the, at the first semester this year. Uh, we don't have it here. And this is uh, one, maybe, I sense this is one cause. Uh, when you mention, for instance, um, Google, Facebook, they all rely on uh, infrastructure, hardware, I mean. So China and India are in uh, very advantageous positions. And at, on the other hand, I think that, I, I feel that we don't have a critical mass of, of um, especially programmers. Uh, I think Brazil is, lacks uh, very much in that uh, particular area. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like to hear your comments. Uh, this is my, this are, these are my assumptions at least, but uh, I feel that many other people sense the, the same way mm -hmm. I do. So I'd like your comments, please. Thank you. Uh, so, so I'd be happy to make a couple of comments. Um, I actually think that the, ba the infrastructure barriers are becoming less and less important. So if you look at a company like Netflix, for example, even though it was founded in Silicon Valley, they did not acquire and build their own uh, infrastructure to do what they wanted to do, right? They went out to uh, Amazon, for instance. And so the ability to, um, to get access to large-scale infrastructure, uh, essentially with a credit card, and yes, that takes money and that takes financing, but you don't have to buy and set up all of that infrastructure on your own like you did only five or 10 years ago, right? I mean, there was a big barrier to entry 10 years ago when you had to acquire, physically acquire uh, and operate 
infrastructure like that. So I think the ability to get infrastructure on demand has helped lower some of those barriers. Maybe I just want to say one other thing about this valley of death, right? That you're in a university, you've got a great idea, and you know there's there's commercialization on the other side, and there's that valley of death. And um, what are things that can help you get across that valley of death? And I mentioned that the National Science Foundation has two programs. One is called ICOR, I dash C O R P S, um, and that's like a boot camp. It's uh, typically done two weeks, you go there for two weeks, NSF pays for you, you get trained, you, and you, you have to go and make 100 contacts with people who are your potential customers, and you learn how to do a business plan and things like that. My sense is that there are opportunities to do that right here in, in Rio, so is Andre Massa here somewhere? Oh, he's right there. Uh, so I know he's he's got a company that's doing some kinds of things like that, and that they are actually, they've been working with folks at Berkeley uh, in California who actually have what's called an ICOR node, which is sort of a, a central hub, if you will, for the ICOR program that NSF runs in the United States. So um, I think there are ways uh, to get across that, that valley of death or to get help getting across that valley of death. Infrastructure. You know, if you need satellites, we don't yet have satellites on demand, although we're getting actually pretty close <laughs> to that with CubeSats and things like that, but that's going to be another five years. If you need satellites, that's pretty tough. If you need computing infrastructure um, and other, maybe some other kinds of infrastructure, you may be able to get some of that more on demand than you know, even just a couple of years ago. Uh, so uh, can I chime in a little bit? Hello? Yes, please. OK. So uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm originally from India. And you use uh, India as example in terms of launching that satellite, whatever, uh, with 128 satellites or whatever that number is. So I want to uh, relate per my personal experience and see whether that helps. So I came to US almost 34 years ago. Uh, and you know, India has gone through a major transformation during those 34 years. And during that time, you know, there were people like me and others who looked at glass as half empty and we thought it will be very difficult for India to make progress and India is not a place where you can do companies and you can do things. So I can tell you from my uh, personally, now I regret having taken that position and I have kind of more or less stayed out of any action in India either uh, from entrepreneurship side or creating real uh, um, uh, solid collaborations uh, with organizations in India. Now, as you know, despite all the challenges that India had for the last 30 years, there are many, many areas where Indian entrepreneurs, Indian researchers and so on have done something amazing. And you can take examples of infrastructure that Brazil doesn't have and maybe India does, but you may be surprised, even today, India cannot make a single chip or an ASIC. India does a lot of software development work. India can launch the satellite that you mentioned, but it still does not have the infrastructure to make chips. And you would think, oh my God, if you can't make a country of that size and that economy, if you cannot make your own chips, uh, you would be very handicapped. And in some sense, they are. In other sense, they said, OK, we don't make chips, but what else can we make? And what can we do uh, by getting chips from elsewhere? But we build uh, other kinds of systems and software. And with that, what kind of products and value proposition we can bring to our own country and then maybe globally as well. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that if I look at uh, what has happened in India and how they have long ways to go. I'm not saying India is uh, has overcome every all challenges. They have long, long ways to go. But at the same time, what they have been able to accomplish, despite some of their infrastructure challenges and other financial, financial institution challenges, uh, political challenges, and all of that, is amazing. And I think when I compare that to Brazil now versus India 20 years ago or 30 years ago, Brazil is very well positioned. And yeah, there are some challenges, but hopefully you will also find ways to overcome them or despite some of those limitations, 
being able to create interesting technologies, products and companies as well. Yeah, uh, I would like to add before the second question, uh, the most important thing is uh, the willingness to do it. If you have an idea, if you want to put it in place, uh, go for it, push it, and uh, that's the most important thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Hello, um, I'm Ana Nascimento, and I work for an uh, innovation research and innovation company. And I would like to know if there is any kind of strategy that strategies that big companies can have to make make the process of innovation faster. Because I feel like big companies, they are um, kind of missing some space on the market share because they cannot innovate as fast as startups and small companies. And if there is any type of strategies that we can work for that. Is, is that strategies for uh, more mature companies that you're asking about or to, to accelerate? So Guru, I, maybe I'll repeat the question and I'll hand it mm -hmm. to you. The question was about, um, are there strategies that more mature companies can use to innovate more rapidly, right? So that startups can innovate rapidly, they can change relatively quickly, but I think uh, more you know, mid-scale and larger companies, it takes them longer to innovate. Yes, I guess uh, maybe uh, I'm a biased party and I don't have too much uh, trust or faith that uh, big companies can really uh, innovate and uh, do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm always struggling with uh, leading incumbent companies uh, that can see uh, that there are disruptive innovations that are going to hurt them and still they struggle to embrace them and be able to find a way to, uh, you know, uh, run with those disruptive innovation because uh, typically what that means is that they will have to uh, cannibalize or they will have to uh, let go of their existing revenue base and their existing uh, product lines and they really struggle to do that. So honestly, uh, there aren't too many good examples uh, that uh, we can point to where uh, large companies have been able to embrace disruptive innovations very effectively and uh, continue to remain on top of things. I mean, the, uh, recently there are a couple of companies that probably uh, will set a good model, but still it is too early. Uh, so, I mean, Google may be an example that is constantly uh, innovating and able to uh, embrace disruptive innovation. But even there, one could argue that if you look at it, uh, Google tried again and again to be able to do social networking as good or better than Facebook and hasn't been able to do that. Um, and anyway, I can uh, give other examples. So I think, uh, and so I would like to ask the person who asked the question, why are you wanting to focus on large companies to be able to do uh, disruptive innovation? If I were in your shoes, I would want to say, what can I do in Brazil and elsewhere where I can enable smaller companies uh, and research, I mean, people that are coming out of research to be able to create disruptive innovations and create companies around them. Large companies is a much, much harder problem in my opinion. Right, Guru, so let me ask you a question. Let's say I'm working in a large company. Let's say you're a CEO for a large company <laughs> and you know you need to Go innovate. Ahead. I guess strategies that I've seen companies employ, I don't know how successful they are because the companies that I would name, you, you wouldn't probably uh, think they were successful. But I have seen, you know, the, the companies will do incubators and startups and, you know, charter a group to go off if they'll do their own seed funding of it and tell them to go off and work on their own like a startup. So I, I, I know companies employ that. I don't know how successful that is. Yes, I think uh, you're right. Uh, that, I mean, there are these um, mechanisms that uh, large companies employ. And, you know, I would say it's of, uh, you know, there's a mixed success, but that's not surprising with uh, any kind of disruptive innovation. So uh, one company in the networking space that has done this multiple times is Cisco. Uh, they have done a couple of kinds of things. One is they have allowed their own 
uh, employees to step out uh, and chase the disruptive innovation. Cisco funds it. If that uh, spun out company delivers, uh, then Cisco has acquired them uh, at a pretty significant price, maybe a billion dollar in few cases, and then brought them in and then um, uh, continued. Uh, and the second thing Cisco has done and other companies do that is acquire companies, uh, even though they might not have started it, uh, they may acquire uh, companies uh, as they are succeeding and bring them in and that is how they bring uh, innovation or disruptive innovation into the company. And I would say that uh, both of these uh, have had uh, mixed successes uh, and, but I think one could argue that that is unavoidable. So, so maybe that is the model that, and then there is a Google that allows its employees to have one day to do whatever they want to do. And people say that based on that one day, whatever employees can do has led to some disruptive innovations and that has become mainstream products for Google as well. So those are definitely some of the mechanisms a large company can use. Hi, my name is Guto. I'm from faculty at UFI. Uh, thank you for coming. I have a couple of questions here, more related to the case. Uh, as a faculty, we are not basically we basically have no incentives to take a license of the university to try to run a startup, uh, mostly or because of the positions that we have. So my question is, what kind of incentives the professor from U.S. universities may have to take a license and try a startup? The second one is what kind of benefits the university may have allowing the professors to have this experience. And the third one is basically what kind of benefit, uh, uh, the ratio, if you have any idea of the ratio of success of these cases, um, which is good for the professor and for the university. Okay, uh, those are all great questions, Guto. Uh, the first thing I, I guess I would say is there's no single answer in the United States about what kind of deals faculty get or what kind of arrangements you get. It's a very local decision. The uni each university will make a very separate decision about what it will allow its faculty to do and what it will not allow its faculty to do. Um, if, if you receive NSF funding, the university owns the rights to that and they usually negotiate with faculty about how that's actually handled. Uh, I'm gonna I, I will tell you what Guru is going to say because I found it. He, this question came up when we were when we were downtown with the at the Academy of Sciences about his experiences with different com with different universities. My experience with the university that I come from was that they wanted to get a lot of money up front and they wanted to own the as much as they possibly could. I think there are other universities. I think Stanford. Guru. <laughs> Hi, Kalpana. Jim. Jim. <laughs> hey, sorry, my I'm running out of battery. So, give me one second, and okay. I will connect. Did anybody see that YouTube where I think it was a, a Korean person, and the dog comes in, and then almost oh, his baby comes in, right? And then the dog comes in. And so, so anyway. Okay, so I guess I have to move because um, I was running out of power, and okay. so uh, uh, anyway, so uh, so Jim, uh, I'm sorry, I was a bit distracted. My apologies. So, can okay. you tell me uh, what is the question you are asking yeah, so, me? Well, the question the question had to do with university policies towards faculty who want to do uh, innovation and may want to do a startup, and and what I was saying, and and so Guto, who asked the question, was saying, well. There, there may be not incentive here to actually go and, and, and do that. And I said, you know, the first answer about, well, how are things in the United States is that there are as many different policies as there are universities in the United States. So it's all decided on a local basis. And some universities tend to try to grab as much as they can and constrain their faculty. And I can tell you it's no fun negotiating <laughs> with uh, your Office of Intellectual Property when they're mm -hmm. on the, they're negotiating against you, basically, right? Because you're talking about what I know, exactly. they want, right? Um, and, and there are other, uh, other universities, and I'll take Stanford as an example, 
where my impression is faculty go off, they do companies, they do great companies, they come back, they spend a few years in the university, they teach, they get grants, they write papers, they come up with another great idea, they go off and do another company. And my sense is that Stanford really embraces that and thinks of that as part of being a faculty member. At my university, sometimes, depending on who the president of my university is, sometimes they're very open because they think that a university should serve, you know, we're being funded by the government, so we should help create wealth, we should help create companies, and so we should spin off companies and, and get rewarded for that. And other times we have presidents who think, oh no, you know, uh, that's not your job, your job is to teach, and don't worry about that. So it changes, even at one university, it can change. But Guru, you have experience at Washington University first and then at Stanford, and I think those were both two different experiences for you. Yeah, and I think, uh, Jim, you summarized it so well. So I think um, I completely agree. So if I had to go very specific, uh, so for example, at a place like Washington University, that is a fine university. I spent whatever, 11, 12 years, loved it. Excellent, excellent university. No issue with that. However, when it comes to entrepreneurship, uh, yes, I think the Office of Technology Transfer or whatever it is called in different universities can have a very different reaction to uh, faculty and students wanting to start a company. So, for example, now again, uh, my example with Washington University is 12, 13 years old, but I communicate with other professors at other universities and I have advised some of them and I hear the same reaction. You go to a technology office and say, you want to start a company. And suddenly in some universities, uh, the reaction is, they suddenly become very alert and they feel as if you're going to steal something away from the university and their job is to protect it. Right. And so the entire conversation then begins about how they are going to protect what you're trying to take away and whether the university is going to get a, get, get a fair deal in that particular process. Whereas if you come to Stanford, uh, I have had a couple of experiences here uh, in the, that context. You go and talk to any administration and you want to say, hey, you're wanting to start a company or something. The first thing is, how can they help? How can they do introductions? How can they uh, help you uh, understand whether this is the right idea, whether this idea has a long legs, whether uh, this is likely to succeed? So the whole conversation is all about how can they help do uh, help you do this successfully and then sometime much later the conversation will be about oh okay are you doing it right from the point of view of being fair to the university and all of that and there is tremendous trust that students and faculty especially uh, that they are doing it for the right reasons and they have the right um, you know kind of uh, standard and they will do the right thing for the university as well. So I think that is the mindset uh, that universities need to have. And unfortunately, uh, many universities still uh, don't have that. Another thing is, what is the success metric for professors at a university? More and more universities want to count publication. They want to count, um, you know, citations and stuff like that. And they don't really, universities are not asking, what is your real impact of your research? And at Stanford, I believe the administration and the university puts a lot of emphasis on the real impact rather than number of publications or any other kind of a metric. And so if that is the case, then professors and grad students are definitely motivated or incentivized to take their research and take it all the way so that you can show that your research could really impact the industry and can impact the society. And that is the ultimate reward uh, as a researcher and that is what the university values uh, as well. So uh, I hope in Brazil, at least some universities and once a couple of universities start doing that, hopefully others can follow as well. Um, if you're interested, there's a, I read a, an amazing interview with the president of Stanford University, former president uh, John Hennessy. If you were to Google John Hennessy, Stanford Innovation, and Nick McEwen, you'll read, uh, it, 
it's a very insightful interview about how the president of the university thinks about innovation and why it's, why it's important. One of the things that I was very excited to come and be at the National Academy of Sciences here to talk about is the decisions about how innovation is rewarded is made way, way above us, right? It's not faculty, it's made by presidents of universities, it's made by the people who govern universities and in your federal government. And, and I hope that those people hear the message about the value of innovation. And as Guru says, it's about the impact of your research, right? Yes, you get impact by having citations and a big H index and stuff like that, but you also have impact by creating products and by creating wealth and having people use your technology. Okay, there was a third question, which is, uh, what is the ratio of success? Probably you don't know about the US, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, the success in the UMass cases or in Stanford cases. These professors, you have an idea of that uh, had the opportunity to have a startup and then it was extremely successful or some others was not that worse for it for the university? Uh, well, I, I could give you some, some UMass examples. So when I was chair, I supported, chair of my department, I supported a faculty member who wanted to go off and found a company and we arranged for him to do that and he did extremely well with his first company He's a serial entrepreneur. Well, I should say then he left the university permanently. Uh, he was a great faculty, I mean a really brilliant algorithms person. And he started a company, uh, sold it, did extremely well, had a couple verticals. And the second one was not quite as successful and he's working on his third one now. Um, so, so I think, I don't know what the percentages are, you know, fraction of faculty who are who are successful. I guess I've seen people start up companies and do really well and not come back. And I've seen people who tried to start up companies, they didn't take off and they came back. I've seen faculty who started companies, they took off and they came back. So they're all over the place. And I don't know, Guru, comments on Stanford? Yes, I guess I don't think, I, I mean, I don't have any real data or statistics. I can give anecdotal information and also uh, give a couple of examples. So I think the first thing I, I want to say that uh, this doing entrepreneurship by nature is a high risk, high reward kind of a game. And so anybody who says that their hit rate is 100% uh, is unlikely that uh, I mean, uh, I would find it difficult to believe that they have a hundred percent hit rate. So by nature, there will be some successes and there will be some failures. So that is one observation I want to make. And I have seen that being true for Stanford faculty as well as students as well. I mean, there are many uh, companies that were started by Stanford students uh, with some uh, faculty and they have not uh, been successful. So even for Stanford, that is true. The second thing I will say is that a lot of times success is very difficult to kind of uh, measure. So I will give you very, I mean, you know, some of you may know uh, Nick McEwen, uh, who is, uh, you know, uh, now kind of father of SDN and has amazing success rate in startups and also in creating a new research discipline and all of that. Uh, and he's known for creating multiple companies that have been very successful. But one company that you might not have heard that Nick did is called Nemo. Uh, it's um, Nemo, uh, I mean, of course, Nemo for Nemo Fish, but it was also Network Memories uh, was what it was about. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Nemo uh, as a company didn't go, didn't become much bigger. I don't think it was bigger than maybe 10 people. Uh, it was acquired by Cisco Systems for a relatively small amount of money that nobody took a notice of. So among uh, various companies that Nick has done, Nemo is, by some metric, the least successful and least known in many ways. However, what is important is the Nemo technology is very, very widely used inside Cisco um, in almost uh, every router or every uh, place where they use network memories, uh, they use Nemo technologies and the Nemo algorithm. But so by that metric, Nemo was a grand success. But by another metric, Nemo was nearly not a success and very few people talk about it or know about it. So sometimes 
the successes how to measure is not as easy uh, as you think. Uh, I mean, I can give you other example of the other type where there might be a company that got acquired for a billion dollar by another big company. I mean, Cisco has done that many times. They would acquire a company for a billion dollar and once that company gets acquired, uh, you find out that that product does not go anywhere. And as a result, on one end, one can claim that company was very successful because it had a billion dollar exit. On the other hand, if the technology got never used or never became a part of a mainstream project, project, pro, product, then I consider that to be a failure rather than a success. Anyway, I so this is how something we should keep in perspective. Uh, Romil, Professor Romil do Toledo from Civil Engineering. I'm also Vice Director of COPY. So we are always discussing here how to to break a kind of paradox we have in Brazil because we are, we have, we believe we have a good education system, good universe at least. We have uh, good ranks of publications. We are between top 15 in the world in terms of number of papers, but there is a ranking that we don't know how they make this ranking, but that says that Brazil is between the maybe 69 or 70 in innovation. So. We are behind several other countries in Latin America that we don't see how can they do that innovation. But that's how the rank is saying that we are very below. But then, then one thing is, I would like to hear a little bit about this. Uh, legislation, regulation, is it important for innovation in terms of university regulation? You mentioned here, read something, but state regulation, is it important? How? is this situation in US, for example. The other thing is, uh, who is responsible for innovations? Is it the state or the private sector? If NSF is out, innovation would be the same or not in US, if you take the money from NSF, or the Brazilian agents, should they put more money? So where are we wrong, if we are wrong? We believe that yes, because we are not innovative, but I, I have a bit more of. Okay. Uh, let, I can. I would like to conclude that this. Uh, the other thing is, is it faculties or students that really makes the innovation? Sometimes I'm very confused about that. Sometimes I think that we faculties are not with the proper spirit to make the innovation. Maybe we have some knowledge, but I'm not sure that we are the guys to do that. But. I would like to hear this about as well, about from you as well. What really matters on innovation? And, and to conclude my only question, this is only one question. <laughs> What's the importance of incubators, entrepreneurship labs? What the university can create as environment to help promoting? Oh, this doesn't make any sense. Leave the students who work in the labs, they will do it. That, that's my only question. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll just say three parts of your question then, and I'll answer, I'll give you my take on each of those three parts. One had to do with government policies, one had to do with faculty versus students, and one had to do with incubators. And, and let, let me start off with government policies. Um, it, it's been very interesting to me to look around different countries around the globe and see very different approaches to innovation. I think it's fair to say that in the United States, we at NSF, for example, we fund very, very far upstream. So we fund for basic research. We do have, um, we do have programs like i and the Small Business uh, Innovation Fund, which helped a company like you saw Qualcomm get started, right? But that's just at the very, very beginning. I think the real investment that it really takes to make a company successful comes from the private sector and primarily comes through venture capital. And, and I'll let Guru comment on that more. On the other hand, there are other governments um, in Europe, for example, that will make more investments actually in companies themselves. And so different, different countries just take different roles. Um, and in the US, my sense is the role that government agencies do not really get involved with startups other than at the very, very early stages to help them on their career. Uh, my comment about faculty and students is the following. I've said it now three times. Nothing happens without students, right? That <laughs> if you want to have something good happen, 
if you don't have good students who, you know, yes, you as a faculty member, you can lead them, you can provide inspiration. Uh, sometimes the best technical ideas come from students. Sometimes they come from faculty, but you're dead in the water without students. That's just, that's my view of research. It's my view of startups and entrepreneurship that, that really it's gotta be uh, a multi-way street involving both faculty uh, and students. I, um, I'll share you just a personal story with you. Um, when I was making pitches for a company that I was hoping to start to venture capitalists, and we had PhD students who were, uh, we have a saying, all in, right? It means, yeah, this is the thing you're going to do. And they asked me as a faculty member, well, will I give up my job and go work for this company that we want to start? And my answer was, I would do it half time, but I love being a professor way too much. Hmm. And they basically said, the door is over there, right? Forget it, right? If you're not really, <laughs> if you're not all in and you're not passionate about what you want to do, uh, they weren't they weren't interested and I see that I've seen that passion in students and I've seen that passion in faculty who have gone off and you know left the university and started companies and, and, and been successful and then you know there are plenty of us who are professors who just love being professors right and how would you ever want to do anything else in the world so uh, I guess it takes it takes all types and I don't really know enough to comment on the incubator question. Maybe I'll, I'll leave that to, to Guru or, or, or folks here to comment on. But Guru, you have comments on uh, the role of government, the role of students, and the role of incubators? Yes, I guess uh, I would say, uh, you know, there was a very uh, contrast. What if NSF were to disappear? Would U.S. innovation suffer? And I would say most definitely. I mean, I think... Uh, if you look at uh, at least uh, everything that I have been involved in personally and things that I see around me, um, all the early research, and I think Jim keeps saying that NSF funds basic research, and yeah, maybe that is its mission, but NSF does more than basic research fund. I mean, at least uh, in uh, both networking uh, technologies that, uh, that I have been involved in, Yes, NSF funded research, then NSF funded building of systems, then NSF funding creating uh, what we call kits, both in the case of Gigabit as well as in the case of SDN, then NSF funded distribution of these kits in both cases to universities, building the infrastructure, demonstrating all of this. So NSF funds this spectrum and then uh, uh, I did not add, as uh, uh, Jim said, NSF also fund SBIR and this thing. So NSF does fund this spectrum, and that is extremely, extremely important to take an idea to a point where it is ready to be funded by a venture capitalist. So I think you can think of it as a pipeline, and what NSF does is does feed that pipeline so that maybe up to one third or one fourth of that innovation is maturing uh, to the point that then the VCs, the venture capitalists can step up and take it and take it to the next level. If you only look at it from the point of view of relative funding, then yes, NSF is doing maybe only 5% of the funding and the private equity is doing uh, 95%. But when you look at it from the point of view of impact, NSF may be doing 20-30% of that, uh, and then the VCs take it and take it uh, to the next level. So that is how I think about the uh, NSF funding, which I believe is extremely important for the continued innovation in the United States. Okay? Uh, coming back to your grad student versus uh, faculty role, I mean, I 100% agree with Jim that students are the engine for research and subsequently taking that innovation, turning it into products and companies and all of that. Students play an extremely important role. Um, but I think it is, at least in the Stanford context or my experience at Washington University, it was really the combination of faculty and student that led to kind of very successful uh, outcomes in many cases because a lot of times students have the bright ideas, students can develop those ideas, they have all of that uh, fearlessness because they are typically young 
uh, and uh, uh, you know all in kind of the attitude that Jim talked about. But a lot of time for big successes, sometimes the faculty members broader perspective where to focus and where to um, go after can play a big role as well. And I would say that combination is what makes uh, this successful. If you had students without the faculty, it will be very hard. And if you're only faculty and no student, it will be uh, hard and impossible as well. Uh, what was the third thing? I forgot uh, the third incubators. question. Incubator space or incubators oh, or I see. Y combinators or whatever you want to call them. Oh, so I think, um, I mean, this is a very uh, interesting trend that is that has happened in the venture industry. And as a result, uh, things such as Y uh, combination or, or combinators and so on are having bigger and bigger impact. And the reason is that uh, VCs, believe it or not, more and more are wanting to fund later stage companies in the sense that uh, if you look at, at least I'm more familiar with um, uh, Sand Hill Road or the, uh, the Silicon Valley VC scene where everybody's raising now a billion dollars uh, as a venture fund and their partnership is not growing that much. So what that means is that they want to invest bigger amount of money into startups and what that means is that they are wanting to invest later than in very very early stages and because of that these incubators especially the uh, the Y combinator that particular example that Jib mentioned those have been very successful because they are investing very very early when the team is only a couple of people and uh, they take it on or maybe up to eight or ten people and then the traditional VCs step in and then um, take it to the next level. So because of this trend in what is happening in the VC industry, those kinds of incubators are playing a bigger role. Uh, just one second. Guru, could you move your camera away from the window because of the backlight? Uh, just a little bit. Uh Oh, I think my problem is uh, my power is running out, and so I'm oh. sitting. <laughs> so let me see. Uh, is this angle better? Yeah, yeah, much better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. Okay. Hello. Hi. So I have a, I have a simple question, I guess. Uh, do you? Uh, people on academia should uh, be worried about developing a product when doing research. I'm sorry, could you, the beginning, I missed the beginning of the sentence. Okay, do you think people in academia should be worried about developing a product when doing research? Uh, I, I, let me see if I can rephrase the question. Do I think that people in academia should be worried about doing research Instead of, oh, that leads to, oh, that leads to, ah, okay, so that's a great question. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really good question. I guess I've always been a believer that you should, you should, you know, this notion of curiosity-driven research, right? You work on what interests you, and then if you can see a way to commercialize that, that's a, that's a wonderful thing, I think. Uh, you know, you don't you don't work on a problem. You don't pick a problem to work on because you think you could publish it. You work on it because you think it's an interesting and an important problem. If I were, uh, I guess maybe I'm in the position to do that. But uh, you know, I, I don't. I guess I wouldn't say personally. I'd want faculty to be picking research problems just because they're they think they may be commercializable. I mean, I think the great. Uh, the great joy and also the great responsibility of being able to pick your own research problems is to pick things that you think are important and important not necessarily because it'll make you a lot of money or whatever you want, why, whatever you want to commercialize it. So, um, but I think there's a pretty big intersection between interesting problems and commercializable things. And so just pick something in that sweet spot and you get them, you get them both. I've got two questions in different places of, of the, the pipeline. 
On one side, you get students, young students. They have to be educated by university. Do you think, is there a space for formal education in terms of innovation? I mean, reshaping curricula and trying to learn something from that. Right. O on the other part, we in Brazil have a very sophisticated financial market, but we don't see much excitation about venture capital. W what's, the, the, in your opinion, the big deal about attracting this sort of capital? Okay, so let's see. The, the second question was, what's the big thing about attracting venture capital? What's the way to? What's the? What the way to? To oh, try how to? Do you attract uh, yeah, venture yeah. Capital? Okay, and, and I'm sorry. The first question was. Is about form education. I mean, we're oh, shaping oh, right, about formal education in innovation. In so innovation. I, I will tell you something that I see in almost every major American research university is that there are opportunities to take courses in entrepreneurship. So it's very, very common for a business school together with an engineering school or a computer science school in particular to run courses on entrepreneurship. So there are opportunities in the United States at almost every major research one university to, to get some formal education there. Another thing that you'll find in a lot of universities are competitions, business competitions where you will get, so the one at MIT is very famous, it's very long going, and students will often do this as part of a course or you're an undergrad and you've got a senior project that you're doing and you'll enter your project into a, into a business competition and a lot of times, the judges will be venture capitalists, and a lot of times you'll get $100,000 or something like that as, as seed funding. So I think universities are trying to encourage things that way. Um, in terms of venture capital, I think maybe I'll turn that over to Guru. He's got way more experience with venture capital than, than I do. Um, I don't think either he or I know too much about <laughs> the venture capital availability here in um, here in Brazil, but I don't know, do you have comments about venture capital in the US, Guru, and attracting it, and what attracts it? I guess uh, not really. I mean, I guess what I would say is that uh, when you have a couple of successful, so I, mean, I guess maybe there are a couple of things that are very uh, clear. Uh, I mean, I think I hope uh, that you are asking the question beyond that. So to attract venture capital, the first thing is there has to be a top tier university. Uh, there has to be uh, people doing um, research that has the potential to be. So those things definitely help. Then there has to be a few examples of people that have uh, done successful uh, startups. And then there is a pipeline uh, that you can see. And then the, that is how you can attract maybe the venture capitalist. But that is a very generic answer. Uh, and I don't really know anything beyond that, uh, what people do to attract uh, VCs uh, to a particular geography. I, I will say one thing I've noticed with venture capitalists is that one, one venture capitalist can introduce you to another. And once you get into that network, it, uh, it can be sort of self-propagating in that way. Uh, something that I've heard Guru say is that um, innovation is sort of in the air and in the water at Stanford. And I've noticed that when I'm out there. It just seems that everybody there has connections. And again, I think growing those connections here and getting yourselves into that network of people who fund, uh, who fund activities as venture capitalists is probably a wonderful thing. I have no idea how to do that. I do in the U.S., but not here. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hello. Professor. Thank you for this afternoon. Uh, uh, as an unfold developed country, Brazil watches many of uh, high potential students leave after they graduate or, I don't know, go to grad school. And many of these students have fully potential to be innovative and start their own companies, their own startups. Uh, do you see uh, clear steps that we could take to m maybe overcome this problem? To overcome the problem of students leaving the yes. country? Yes. Uh, well, that gets back to the earlier question, I think, about what government can do. So, for example, and let me say that Brazil is, is, is not alone there. So I, I've, I've spent a lot of time in France, as several people here have. And 
the entrepreneurial climate because of government policies about when you hire people, if you hire them more than some number of years, it's impossible to unhire them. And so that people will go across the English Channel, French people, and start their companies in the south of England because the business climate and the hiring rules and the labor laws there are more amenable to, um, uh, to, to startups and being nimble. And so I do think that government policies, and I think the government here must care about innovation. I have no idea what one does to get laws changed uh, here in Brazil. Uh, but I do think that that's really important and that government can put a real damper on things because I, I have seen that in other countries. I, d I don't know about the situation here. So, um, I'm an undergraduate student here uh, at UFRJ and my question regards motivation. Um, as an undergraduate student, uh, sometimes it's a bit hard to be motivated by, by college uh, as a general and, and I feel like most of my um, colleagues feel the same. I don't know that's not a, a problem that's um, exclusive to Brazil. So my question is how can we innovate and talk about motivation if we have a, um, a student potential and students play a major role in innovation, but we have issues like many students failing courses and abandoning co abandon college and things like that. From a, from a student point of view, um, what are your comments on how uh, we can overcome that, those challenges? Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat the question just so that uh, Guru can get that to it. Your question was about students and motivation and uh, you know, we've all been students, right? And uh, <laughs> I will tell you, I don't, I've never had a student, so I've graduated a lot of PhD and master's students, and my own student experience, uh, it's like being on a swing, right? You go up and you come down, and you go up and you come down, and that, that really is a natural, it's just the natural part of being a graduate student. So, you know, I remember thinking, that my PhD, my PhD thesis was gonna be the absolute landmark piece of work in computer science. And then, I, you know, a month later, I'm thinking, oh, this is like the stupidest thing anybody has ever done. <laughs> and, and you do, I think that cycle is just normal. So A, you shouldn't feel bad about that because every one of my students has gone through that up and down, and I've gone through it. And I think one of the roles of advisors is to help students over those things. You know, I will say that um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a word, uh, resilience, that people are using a lot in the United States now. And that is, how do you train students? How do you raise your kids? So for those of us who have kids, right, you want to raise people, you want to raise your kids because life's always full of up and downs, right? And how do you respond to that? Uh, because it's, it's just a natural part of being human. Uh, as far as I can tell, you know, the literature seems to tell you that uh, failing and picking yourself up and, and knowing that hmm. success can follow failure is part of making your kids resilient, right? So my wife and I, we make sure that we are, there's a, there's a saying in the U.S., helicopter parents. It's the parents who fly over their children and make sure that everything is perfect for their children. And that's not the way you, 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 you raise resilient children. At least that's what the literature says. So I, I, I guess what I... Sorry, that was a long, probably incoherent answer. But I, but I think the important thing is, is that a to realize that that things do go, things do go up and down, and you know if you go through a long down period, maybe it's the case that you want to be doing something else than being a PhD student, and that's that's a hundred percent fine, right? In the end, professors want their students to be happy and to be successful, and maybe that's not what they're doing, but maybe it is. I would just say again, don't get down just because. You know, you're in, a, you're in a down period and you, and you failed courses. I, I'd be embarrassed to tell you what my first grade was in a math course when I went to college, right? Uh, it was below failing. Um, you know, those things happen. If, if you can't get that motivation long term, then maybe it's time to think about something else. But again, it's just natural going up and down, I think, as a, as a student. I don't know. You want to add to that, Guru? 
No, that was an uh, excellent, excellent um, answer. And I hope uh, that is, I mean, I guess the only thing I will ask uh, the, the questioner is, is the person talking about some systemic or institutional issues uh, that make it harder for students to be motivated? And if that is the case, it would be, uh, you know, good to understand and hopefully uh, the universities and the government uh, can uh, uh, maybe working on them. But otherwise, what Jim said is so true and I could not have articulated it any better. So uh, well, I want I to leave it at that. When you said it has to do with the university or the system, we got a thumbs up. So maybe there's certainly a component of that, I guess. Right? So I don't know, when you're, when you're in a, what do you do when you're in a situation where the, uh, almost the culture around you or the laws or the, you know, the system that you're operating in is getting you down? Wow. But, <laughs> but I think then uh, what this particular conversation or what the Brazilian Academy tried to do during the last couple of days is an example of where they are wanting to understand and see whether they can do better. And hopefully that trend will continue and that will help address some of those issues that uh, may be there. Um, so, right, so uh, And again, honestly, I don't have enough visibility to say more. I, you know, I guess I would say I've always felt this as a student and now as a faculty member. If there are issues in which the system that you're in needs to be changed, surfacing, raising those issues with the people who are in your department or university or government is always an important thing. You know, I will tell you now having worked in government for three years, I've just been incredibly impressed by the people who I've met in government who are really there to do the right thing. And, you know, they don't always know the right thing because they have a certain set of background. Um, and so bringing ideas to those people I think is always a valuable thing. Oh, uh, just to add in the venture capital answer, right? Uh, it was an excellent question. And uh, in this moment in Brazil, we have more than one billion reais available to invest in early stage startups, right? So, so the question is how to uh, how to have access to this money, right? And uh, I would answer that you, you have three key ingredients, right? The first one is to have a good team. The second, a scalable business model, and the third, to find the first uh, paying customers. If you have a good team, a scalable business model, and the first paying customers, a lot of venture capitalists would uh, fight to put money in your company, right? Uh, and uh, uh, let's make a, a question, right? For Guru, also Edmundo, and, and Jim. Uh, what would be your advice for a professor who wants to put a good team together, right? Uh, and innovate through a scalable business model. What would be the, the steps? What are the steps to put together a good team among students, master students, PhD students, how to, to create this group? I, I'm gonna turn that over to Edmundo who's done that and Guru, who's done that, because I'm not the person to ask that question. So Guru, the question is, how do you put together a scalable, what are five steps for a scalable <laughs> business plan, as well as the students who you can put together to execute on that? Is there a magic recipe? Is there an algorithm? <laughs> I guess, uh, so in your question, I guess you didn't mention the most important thing in my opinion and uh, maybe that is you are taking that for granted uh, at least in our context i would say that the number one thing is that there is a particular you can call it a challenge or there is a, a, a change that you are wanting to bring about 
and for the challenge or a change you have a specific technology or ideas through which you think you can address the challenge that you can bring about the transformation so once you have that and then you have a group of people that were involved in taking that idea to creating technologies or something that will help bring about this transformation or the change then that is the most important ingredient now that people can be your fellow faculty member and you that worked on it um so for example the first company i did it was with john turner uh, who was an amazing amazing uh, researcher system builder and all of that and somewhere he and i were complementary and we were able to do it together because we both believed in the same vision and passion and all of that so so i guess uh and then students who also help so to me that is the number one ingredient and once you have that then other things fall in place Uh, because they just said then there would be a customer that will show that oh if you deliver they will use it and that becomes a very important thing uh, then um, uh, other people who have have experience being a product manager or being a vp of engineering who know how to build engineering teams and build products they will step up the, the vc step up so all of those things happen uh, but the necessary condition is that you have something that can solve a problem that is really important or uh, there is a transformation that you can bring about uh, and you have the beginnings of that am i communicating am i making sense yeah so guru i'll, I'll just and then i'll ask edmundo to answer it since he's mm-hmm. done this too you said something now a couple of times that's really struck me that i wouldn't have sort of thought about and that is um building the early prototypes and getting a user in a sense almost a free user community to use it. So when I think about the Apex stuff that you did and the ATM kits that you built at Washu and I think about some of the early open software implementations of an SDN control plane and and um uh, and and that work that it strikes me that something common in both of the startups that you've done was getting code out there I think for free and getting your technology out there for free and getting a user group involved. Mhm. Yes, I think and more and more that is becoming uh the way to do things. Uh I will uh, quote um, a particular I mean you might have heard about Martin Casado who was a, a PhD student at Stanford uh founded Nicera and he's considered one of the key kind of founders of the SDN movement these days he's a venture capitalist in Anderson and Horowitz and uh, he made two observations that are interesting and let me see whether i can communicate as well as he has uh, you know he communicates when he gives talks these days so what he's saying is that for a second if you think about consumer oriented plays right um uh, instagram or uh, any of these uh, social networking even facebook and stuff like that you never know what the teenagers are going to love uh and what they will get attracted to and what are the thing they you know you can push as hard as you like and you don't uh, you can't get teenagers to like it so because of that uh, uncertainty in the consumer space nobody funds any startup until you have a million consumers especially teenagers that are starting to use something once you have a million uh, consumer that are starting to use something then the vcs believe that this has a sticking power and then they want to invest and they want to uh, kind of do this now what is happening even in the enterprise space and in the service provider space is also that more and more decisions are made by developers and engineers the business people are making less and less decisions to buy uh, technologies and products these are made by technical people and technical people tend to be somewhat uh, fickle as well as the teenagers as martin says it and so now uh, the vcs they want to see a technology being developed offered to the developers in enterprises or in companies and if 
the developers are getting attracted to that particular platform or that particular technology and they are wanting to use it, then the venture capitalists believe that this technology has legs or this technology has potential and then they want to come in and invest. So more and more creating open platforms and getting them out uh, and having the developer community or some of the potential users to use it is becoming a necessity before the venture capitalists are willing to take you seriously and they will uh, help you build a company around that. And the good news is, at least in United States, as I mentioned earlier, NSF has been quite helpful in getting it to that level, at least in the academic community, not necessarily in the industrial or in the consumer community. Jim, did I at least elaborate on the point you wanted to make or yep. you had something else in mind? Perfect. Edmundo. A quick question because of, of time. A quick answer. Uh, I, I would go mention what Jim said before. Uh, uh, you have to work to attract the students, uh, find a nice challenging problem that solves some problem. And then it's, it's like doing research. And then you attract the students, you're gonna solve the problem, and then uh, it's a real problem, and then the rest comes uh, uh, with you. And I, I found that it's pretty much similar to do uh, uh, research to attract uh, the good students. So that was a very quick question. But then I have uh, one more question, I guess, to Guru. Then I pass to uh, Professor Watanabe that has a final question here. And Guru, if uh, you, uh, in your opinion, with your experience, uh, if you, someone wants to start a small company, what are things that you sh should tell them to avoid in your experience? Be away from something, to single out something from your experience? So I, I'm assuming when you say a small company, a uh, you're talking about still a technology company, yes, right? You're exactly. not talking about a small company yeah, in yeah, some startup. other space. So if you're talking about the technology space, and when you say small company, you're also, I suppose you mean uh, to begin with it is a small company, but the dream is to make it big, right? Or the dream is to keep it small. So I didn't understand. Can you just quickly clarify your question and then I can maybe answer it? Okay, you yeah. uh, want to build a startup. You have an idea that you believe uh, that is going to be good. You want to st uh, go to an incubator or whatever. You want to build a startup. What are things that you should avoid? Uh, one or two things that, in your opinion, you should avoid. If you can single out something. I guess uh, the people, I mean, I guess as you are building even a small team, the people you should get on your team are the people that believe in your vision and have the passion and they are not joining because they think this is a way to make money. I think there is, may, I don't know whether this is a phenomena in Brazil or not, but in Silicon Valley, as much as it is known for successful startups, a lot of times... Uh, when the teams get formed, uh, things get wrong because some people are motivated by what they're really trying to accomplish versus some people that are motivated by being able to make money quickly. And so that is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, as much as Jim mentioned, it is about intellectual curiosity. When you're trying to start a company, then it is about really solving some real problem uh, and uh, wanting to bring about the change or transformation. It cannot be a company for the sake of... Um, so I think that, that kind of work is done best in research, but not necessarily when you're starting a company. Sometimes people do get carried away by wanting to do a startup just because they're passionate about a, a technology, but it's not necessarily solving a particular problem. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I'm not answering your question that what to avoid, you know, you have to get the right team members. That means you have to avoid the wrong time of team members. You have to avoid doing a company for the sake of doing it. It has to really address a real problem. Uh, what else can I say? Um, I mean, I can't think yeah. of uh, anything else. No, no, it's, it's perfect. You answered the question. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess I go for the last question. I think uh, 
Guru said something that was very interesting in uh, your presentation at the Academy of Science. You said that uh, entrepreneurship is in the DNA of the people at Stanford. But uh, I believe that uh, people there are just uh, human being. And uh, I assume that uh, what we have here are just human being. So the question, how can I activate this DNA that you said that is uh, working there in Stanford? How can we activate it? And those people here, uh, I think uh, there are some words that are very uh, important, passion, face. Uh, also, I think we can create an uh, innovation course. But I would like to hear just some few words on how to activate this uh, DNA that you have in Stanford. And I think they have here, but they are not using now. So again, I guess uh, maybe I will go back to what something Jim said, right? Because uh, in universities, I think the administration and uh, so that also makes a huge difference. So to activate that DNA, uh, it is important that the administration has the right mindset and they start to give appropriate guidance to their organization and how they measure success and how they kind of uh, uh, tell their uh, different, uh, you know, the office of technology transfer or their department heads or dean in terms of what is important to the university and how are they going to measure success. So that is at least one of the things that the university needs to do in order to uh, change. The second thing is that there have to be uh, either faculty members or uh, others who are entrepreneur type who can be part of the university and they can become both the champions as well as uh, kind of the people who uh, advocate and provide the right advice and so on. So I think that could make a difference and can help what you're calling activate the DNA because uh, really at Stanford, it's really people at every level, people are very comfortable talking about uh, technology transfer, startups. Uh, they have their own connection. They have their own experiences. And as a result, it is not considered a taboo or it is not considered something inappropriate. And uh, it just, the conversations happen and nobody looks at it in an, any uh, with any kind of a bias, and that is uh, important as well. Maybe Jim can, I'm sure Jim has thought about it as well and can elaborate on it. I guess I would just echo what Guru says. I think the academic environment that is created at the university is really central to activating that. And you know, faculty are not rewarded that much anyway, even if you're incredibly successful. So, so really what it is, is it's about mind share. And, you know, you as, as, as a dean and a leader here and, and the leaders in your university, if they embrace the fact that part, you know, one way to be a very successful professor is to be a successful innovator. It's not the only way, right? So it's great if you have a high H index and you write papers and you're cited. But it's also equally as great if you start companies and you innovate and you and you um, help with the uh, you know the economic welfare of, of of the city and of the region and, and of the country. And if that message goes out to faculty and that message goes out to students, that one way to measure success is in your ability to innovate, and that that is equally celebrated as your ability to publish highly cited papers. That sends a really powerful message. And it's not a costly message in my mind. It's just saying what it is that you value. OK, so uh, I think we have to close this chat. I would like to thank uh, Guru. I hope next time you come and sit here. Um, I know, I would love to. <laughs> yeah. And I also would like to thank James for this uh, chat today. Thank you very much. Bye, Guru.
Okay, I'll see you later.